Hi, and welcome back to Football Made Simple. Pep Guardiola is a short-term manager. Pep Guardiola never renews his contract. Pep Guardiola doesn't really stay at a club for more than three seasons. These are just a few of the preconceptions that Pep has proved wrong during his reign at Manchester City. And it has been an incredibly successful one, winning three Premier Leagues, an FA Cup, four Carabao Cups and two Community Shields for an average of two trophies per season. It is also one of the first times we've seen Pep have to do major rebuilding of his squad, both personnel-wise and tactically. But how exactly have his tactics morphed and transformed each season? Let's take a detailed look. If you enjoyed this video, you may also enjoy these which will be linked down below and at the end of this one. When Pep first arrived at Manchester City, the squad was in a terrible state. The prior season, they had just about qualified for the Champions League on the final day of the season and with the help of goal difference, ending with their lowest points total since the Mark Hughes era. And it wasn't a freak season. The squad was declining rapidly. They had the third oldest first 11 in the league and their only players under 25 were Mangala, who was not up to standard, and Raheem Sterling, who was lacking in confidence. So, Pep had to begin the squad rebuild, spending over £150 million in his first season, with players who would go on to be successes like Gundogan, Zinchenko, Sane, Stones and Jesus, as well as less successful ones like Nolito and Claudio Bravo. And throughout the season, Pep was looking not just for his first choice 11 personnel-wise, but also formation-wise, using the 4-2-3-1 often, the 4-3-3 and various versions of the back three. But, for the most part, his first 11 looked like this. And Pep looked to get his team to play out from the back, with the centre-back splitting. And many teams looked to press City high in anticipation of this, making it much more difficult to play out. And in open play, City faced similar problems, with their centre-backs being pressed consistently, with many teams defending with a front two. And because Otamendi was right-footed, playing at left centre-back, it meant that when under pressure, half the pitch was effectively cut off as he could not pull off the switch to the right-hand side of the pitch, making City more predictable. This is part of the reason Kolarov was adapted to be a left centre-back, as with a left-footed centre-back, it meant that the switches were much easier to pull off, given them a new dimension. And now we come to the fullbacks, who in many ways determined how this side could and couldn't play. Clichy on the left and Sanya or Zabaleta down the right were all ageing and lacked athleticism, and this meant that they couldn't really get high and wide up the pitch to allow the wingers to move more central. At the same time, none of them were good enough to function as the extra centre-back when under pressure to create a 3 versus 2 as if they were dispossessed, the attacker would immediately be running at Bravo. So this meant that it had to be Fernandinho to drop deeper to create this 3 versus 2 against the pressure and help City play out of this phase. This leaves a void in the midfield, and at times, Silva would be happy to drop deeper with De Bruyne moving higher into the 10 position, but Pep wanted both of these men to stay higher up in the half spaces. These tactics might have been different, for example, if the fullbacks could overlap and allow the wingers to come into the half spaces, as then Silva and De Bruyne could play deeper. But the fullbacks couldn't do this, so instead they had to invert into the midfield to be the pivots during the build-up. And again, None of them were great on the ball, so they were easy press targets, and if there was a turnover, City were in danger. And out wide, the wingers provided the width, as the fullbacks couldn't, and they often had one versus one. Down the right, Sterling could often get past his man into a great position to cut the ball back into Aguero or the arriving midfielders. But down the left, this was ineffective, as Nolito isn't one to take on his man and get crosses in, and is instead more of a finisher. In fact, he often drifted central early in the play, and in these scenarios, Silva would have to operate deeper to allow Clichy High to provide the width instead, which would affect the team's structure. The major success stories of this season were Silva and De Bruyne, however, who excelled with his freedom to operate between the lines, and De Bruyne racked up an incredible 18 assists. Lastly, a major reason for the poor performance this season was Claudio Bravo. A series of early mistakes meant that he was low on confidence, leading to error after error for the rest of the season. As a result, City conceded 9 more goals than expected. It was a poor season for City, coming away with no silverware. But looking back, the tactical foundations for the greatest season in Premier League history had been laid. 
Despite the poor results, Pep knew that a few tweaks in some key regions would lead to success. So, still trying to overhaul that aging squad, City hit the transfer market, spending big on fullbacks, a new keeper, a left-footed centre-back and Bernardo Silva. And in this season, Pep knew his first 11 and his preferred formation. City's backline still struggled with injury, with Laporte having a long-term injury and company and Stones having to take turns partnering Otamendi, who stepped up. Mendy also suffered a big injury early on, meaning that Dalf was readapted to be a left-back. So let's look at the tactical differences. And these differences begin at the back, with Edison being a massive upgrade on Claudio Bravo. Edison had a secret weapon, his incredible kicking range. So where before, when teams pressed high, City had to build short. But now when teams tried to do the same, Edison could simply play it over their backline into the runners. So because defenders knew they couldn't keep up with Sterling, Sane, and to a lesser extent Aguero, they would have to start off much deeper. This led to half the team pressing high, but the defence being deep, meaning that there was space in the midfield. And as Edison is an accurate passer, he could easily find the midfielders. As the season wore on, less and less teams pressed City, allowing them to build up from deep easily. Higher up, the new personnel allowed them to change a couple of things. Again, the fallbacks being the biggest difference. At Spurs, Cal Walker was a traditional fullback, overlapping and looking to get crosses in, and Dalf was a natural midfielder. The most important element, however, is that both were better on the ball than their predecessors. So, Pep kept a similar shape in this phase with a back three and a midfield two. But this time, only Dalf would invert, whilst Walker became a third centre back. So, this meant that the two holding midfielders were in their preferred positions, and they were much more press resistant here. Cal Walker as the third centre-back also meant that they had great cover on the defensive transition if they were facing a counter-attack. The two holding midfielders also fully freed up Silva and De Bruyne to push right up into the front line to create a front five. And there is a similar structure to the 16-17 side, but as discussed, in that team, Silva would at times drop deeper to help build up. So now, City had a dedicated front five, so they outnumbered most back fours. And with Sane having come to prominence, he and Sterling would hug the touchline for 90 minutes. But now there was a difference. They were much better in one versus one situations, especially down the left, where Sane could use his pace and dribbling to get past almost any fallback. Down the right, Sterling had gone up another level, making him even more dangerous. But if opposing fullbacks overcompensated and were too touch tight to the wingers, Silva and De Bruyne could receive in the half spaces to make chances for Aguero but most often they would look to play the ball into the wingers running from out to in, who would be too quick for their fallback, and they could then square it across to the arriving winger on the opposite side. But if the opposition fallback started too narrow, the winger could receive the switch and advance. Or, when the fallback then came across to cover, Silva and De Bruyne mastered the half-space run, getting into the perfect positions to cut the ball back into dangerous zones. And they weren't just great offensively, as with Edison and goal, they also led in a lot fewer extra goals than Bravo had in the prior season. This has so far been the peak of Guardiola's Manchester City, and an argument can easily be made that it is the best Premier League side of all time. They won the league with the most points ever and the Carabao Cup, but were faced with disappointment in the FA Cup and Champions League. The old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And in many ways, City followed this advice after a historic season in 17-18. We saw less transfer activity, with the only major incoming being Mahrez from Leicester. And in fact, it's the first season City made a profit in the transfer market in the Pep era, showing that they only intended to tweak things. There were still major changes to the first 11. Laporte was back to full fitness and was like a new signing, but the opposite happened for De Bruyne, who struggled badly with injury. So the first 11 looked like this, with Laporte, Zinchenko, Bernardo and Gundogan playing much bigger roles. Most of the build-up was similar, but Zinchenko and the wingers functioned slightly differently. Zinchenko, like Dalf, is a natural midfielder, so he could easily invert into the holding midfield role. But his natural instinct is to be much higher up the pitch, and down the flanks, Sterling was the first name on the team sheet. But Leroy Sane saw a lot less game time with Sterling often moving to the left instead and Mahrez coming in down the right. This was for a few reasons. Down the left, Zinchenko being much more offensive meant that he was willing to move into the left winger role, 
so it made sense to have an inverted winger cutting in towards the box. And as discussed, Gundogan played a lot more in this left-hand side position, so he was more than comfortable becoming the second pivot alongside Fernandinho. De Bruyne had also been key in dominating this right half space, but with him out, Bernardo provided a slightly different skill set. In addition, Morris was also an inverted winger, who wanted to occupy that role, so we would often see Bernardo moving outside Mares when he was moving infield. These tactical tweaks allowed City to retain the title with more excellent football, and they also won the Community Shield, FA Cup, and Carabao Cup, but faced more Champions League disappointment. Two excellent seasons on the bounce, but what would change in 2019-20? City brought in two key players in this window, Rodri from Atletico Madrid and João Cancelo from Juventus. They also lost some players, in Vincent Kompany and the now out of favour Fabian Delph. Injuries again played a major role, with Sane and Laporte missing almost the whole season, while Stones also struggled. But the bright side was De Bruyne was back, whilst Mendy also had a lot more starts. All of this meant that the first 11 looked like this. Fernandinho found himself playing as the left centre-back often, and instinctually, one would assume having a midfielder on the ball would improve the build-up play. But once again, it was a right-footed left centre-back, one who was unaccustomed to the position no less. So Fernandinho from here firstly had no midfield influence and he couldn't drive up into the midfield as effectively as a Laporte could on his stronger left foot. In addition, whilst Rodri is excellent on the ball, he was still getting used to the team, so was not yet at his metronomic best, so was generally less effective than Fernandinho had been. Mendy was also the most commonly used left-back, and in contrast to Delph and Zinchenko, he's a traditional left-back, and as a result, he would invert a lot less, instead hugging the touchline. So similar to his first season, Pep had to find a solution to this midfield vacuum. Naturally, where the free eights had reigned supreme allowing a front five, that structure now had to be broken, as we often saw De Bruyne dropping alongside Rodri when Silva was playing. Alternatively, when Gundogan played in place of Silva, he would be the deeper man alongside Rodri. Either way, where in prior season, City had a well laid out front five, occupying the five vertical zones, now it was a lot less structured. In addition, playing with one attacking midfielder meant that the threat between the lines was a lot less, allowing the opposition's midfield to be much more secure in defence, as they were no longer outnumbered 5 versus 4. In 2018-19, Pep had begun to experiment with inverted wingers, but still often played Sane to maintain the width. But with Sane out, the inverted winger system was now forced upon him. So, both wingers would come infield early, meaning that the half space would now be crowded in comparison to the season before. It also affected the width. Down the left, Mendy could move into the zone, whilst De Bruyne could also move outside Mahrez on the right. The problem is, neither is great in a 1 vs 1 situation, and both would opt for crosses from these zones rather than looking to move into the box. This made them much more predictable, and in addition, City don't have great headers of the ball. And Sterling and Morris could make runs from the half space in support, but both would be receiving on their weak foot and couldn't as easily get in a first time cross. A slight detail, but an important one. Defensively, City were also a lot weaker, with Rodri being less solid than Fernandinho, and Fernandinho not as good at centre back as Laporte. Otamendi was also poor in this season. As a result, they conceded 10 more goals, and according to expected goals, should have conceded even more but City were still able to win the Community Shield and the Carabao Cup. Questions were raised about Pep's future and whether he had the skill set and desire to replenish the squad. City needed reinforcements. Major incomings included Ruben Diaz, Nathan Ake and Ferran Torres. Major outgoings included Leroy Sané, Otamendi, Angelino and David Silva. In this season on the injury front, Aguero and Mendy struggled, whilst Laporte was first injured, then fell out of favour. We saw three distinct versions of Manchester City in this season, one using the 4-2-3-1, and when De Bruyne was injured, one using the 4-3-3, and finally, we saw the 4-4-2. The 4-2-3-1 was used quite early on and was poor, leading to City going as low as 13th in the league. But in the 4-3-3, initially, Cancelo was the right-back with Zinchenko as the left-back, 
and both are possession-oriented fullbacks, so we would at times see both men inverting into the midfield so that City built with two centre-backs and three midfielders. This would mean there was onus on the wingers to remain wide given the width, regardless of the personnel. The midfield allowed the free eights to once again have a lot of freedom, but Bernardo's role in particular was interesting. As opposed to just pushing up into the half space, he often dropped extremely deep, almost as a right back, and in this position he could get time away from the pressure, and could get his head up to make more penetrative passes. But Cancelo's dynamic role early on was crucial. He wouldn't just keep possession in midfield like Walker or Zinchenko. With Mahrez wide, we could see Cancelo making runs into the half space to pull the ball back, or even cross from deeper regions. But one of the keys was with Cancelo and Bernardo often being ready to attack, Gundogan would now have more freedom and we would see him make runs into the box time and again. As a result, early in the season he got into goal scoring positions again and again, and in fact finished as the team's top scorer. And despite the incredible success they were having, Pep decided to pivot once again, shifting to a 4-4-2. And of course with Pep, it wasn't a traditional 4-4-2, but one with two false nines, dictated by having to fit in a fit again De Bruyne. Sterling had run into some poor form, so he was dropped to the bench, with Foden and Mahrez being the wingers, Gundogan and Rodri as pivots, and Walker back in at right back. The major aim was to overload the midfield, which was facilitated by Zinchenko inverting and both false nines being able to drop deep or make the runs in behind the defence. In addition, City were once again strong in the wide regions, with both Mahrez and Foden happy to take on their men to then get crosses and shots in. It also allowed City to easily overload either side with both false nines, allowing potential switches to the far side to then attack the box. These mid-season adaptations led to one of their most exciting seasons, winning the Premier League and the Carabao Cup whilst reaching the semi-finals of the FA Cup and finishing runners-up in the Champions League. The holy grail that is the Champions League still remains missing for City, but Pep over the years has shown his ability to adapt to different situations. But I'd love if you commented down below which version of City is your favourite. And if you want more detailed look at any season in particular, I will leave more videos linked down below. A quick shout out to my Patreons for helping to make this video possible. If you want to support, head on over to patreon.com slash simple and you'll get rewards like early access to videos and exclusive content. But that's all for today and remember, keep it simple.